Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, I want to talk about a couple things. It's kind of I, it started off with this comment from Barbara Short O'Brien about uh, a Rothschild who died on Monday, uh, which kind of that it did catch my attention. I'll explain why. That led me to going back to a video that I had done before. Uh, called The Significance of 200 Years. Uh, you may recall this video, you may not. Uh, it was kind of a bigger one. It had 12,000 uh, viewers, which is on the higher side for me. And uh, it was comparing the Book of Mormon to the time that we live in and the significance of 200 years. So I uh, went through that with a more fine tooth comb and uh, found some interesting things there. Um, I also wanted to, uh, toward the end of the video, talk about the Lord um, not just hastening his work, but, oh gosh, I already forgot. <laughs> I spent like an hour looking into this, uh, cutting his work short. Okay, because that's, that's a scripture that he would cut his work short. What does that mean? Um, you know, there's there's a, an entire spectrum of opinions when it comes to the second coming and when it's going to happen. Some think it's going to happen very soon. Some think it's going to happen 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now. There's a whole range. And so I thought it'd be good to look at what it means to uh, cut his work short. Okay. So. Okay. So. This is what Barbara Shorter Brain said. Did you know Evelyn de Rothschild died today? Uh, do you know what the name Rothschild means? According to Wikipedia, with the red sign. Rothschild, pronun uh, German pronunciation, okay, whatever, is a name derived from the German Zumrothen Schild uh, with the, <laughs> sorry, with the old spelling TH, meaning with the red sign. So, I decided to uh, look that up. We've talked about this family before. Uh, Wilfred Woodruff spoke with one of them uh, named in in the record from Wilfred Woodruff. He simply calls him Baron Rothschild. We identified who it was, and uh, there's an interesting story there. In fact, it's this video right here. Um, in fact, I might as well pull this. Well, no, I'll just remember. I'll uh, put this the link for this video in the description below, because the Rothschilds have been instrumental uh, with Israel, okay? The the state of Israel setting it up, uh, financing things, paying for things, okay? So make sure to check, that, check out that video if you haven't already. Okay, so this is what I found, New York Times, okay, uh, this happened on Monday, I'm recording this on Tuesday, and yes, I just voted just before making this video, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how things turn out after these elections. A lot of people are calling it the most important elections uh, of our lifetime. I, I guess we'll just see. There's a lot of interesting things surrounding these elections, including uh, the death of, of this guy, Evelyn Day Rothschild. Highlighted a few things. Um, okay, the Rothschild's name and history weighed upon him. Sir Evelyn's father was the chairman and his great-great-grandfather, the founder of N.M. Rothschild and Sons, the British branch of the family banking empire that began in 18th century Frankfurt, Germany. This is kind of where, where this started. Um, actually, I, I, I saw that it was like documented back to the, uh, I think the 16th I don't know if it was the 1600s or the 16th century, but anyway. Okay, so 18th century Frankfurt, Germany, <clears throat> in that with its networks of couriers and spies, financial wizardry, uh, which, you know, if, if you're into the secret combinations, Gadiat and robbers, uh, that is peculiar wording, you know, just putting it out there. Um and political alliances spread across Europe, making fortunes and influencing the destinies of nations for over 200 years. 200 years. <clears throat> this is what led me into all the rest of these tabs right here. 
just this one part, 200 years of uh, this banking family. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's see. So after apprentice, apprentice ships in New York and Toronto, Mr. Rothschild in 1957 joined N.M. Rothschild as a partner in training. Uh, Mr. Rothschild, who rose to chairman in 1976, used it used it to advantage. Like his forebears, he promoted strong ties with Britain's government, news media, and financial and business communities. A financial advisor to Queen Elizabeth II, uh, who knighted him in 1989. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look really quick at our uh, Hebrew calendar. Okay, there's a lot of interesting things that have been going on this year. Um, you know, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but this year started out with a literal bang uh, with an underwater volcano near Tonga, the largest explosion ever recorded on Earth with uh, modern instruments. With modern instruments, there's probably been bigger ones before, but the largest largest one that we've ever seen in modern times happened this year in January, uh, right next to the most LDS nation in the world. Tonga has the highest percentage of its population as members of the church. Okay, February, that's when the Ukraine war started. All right, April. Um, we had a very interesting general conference where there was a big call up for missionaries. Um, just talk after talk after talk uh, during the Saturday sessions, primarily. Later, uh, when we had a fifth Sunday, I think it was in, I'm not sure which, let's see, it must have been July, the fifth Sunday of July. Uh, we reviewed uh, across the church specifically those talks that had to do about serving a mission. Uh, this was the general conference where, in the women's session, President Nelson had a video made that showed President Kimball's prophecy about the women right now, that the women right now in the church are going to be the ones that draw in large members or large large numbers of converts to the church because of being different from the world in happy ways and uh, appealing to the women of the good women of the world that are sick and tired of the way the world is going and bringing their families with them. Uh, the way that he ended the general conference was very interesting. I'm not going to rehash everything. This was the general conference where there were just, there was just all these 17s all over the place. He announced 17 temples to com complete a hundred. I talked about that a lot more in the previous video. So uh, check that one out. Okay, so moving on. Um, you know, there were things that were going on uh, these next couple months, but August is when things kind of got interesting. Okay. Or not August, sorry. It was September. So starting, if I, if I remember all the events, starting on the 5th, there was a gigantic uh, CME or coronal mass ejection from the sun. Basically a large explosion. Um, it was it was facing away from the earth, but it was so big that they're going to be studying it for years. That happened exactly three weeks before Rosh Hashanah, which was on the 26th of September. Okay, three weeks before that, and then three days before Queen Elizabeth II passed away, which was a huge event, you know. For probably the majority of, of you listening, uh, she's been the queen of the United Kingdom um, your entire life, right? For most of us. Interestingly, that's kind of a symbol of a couple things. One is you have a worldly power, a, a literal queen um, that has riches and power that passed away at a time when a lot of us feel like the second coming is just around the door. So... She's been reigning for a long time. She holds second place out of all European monarchs. Well, I think worldwide monarchs. She reigned the longest, regardless of country, except for one French king. But it was because he became king, became king when he was like a child. So for all intents and purposes, she was the longest reigning monarch, really, at like a, as an adult, uh, one that realized that they were <laughs> that they were reigning. 
Um, so that was huge. And what happened is to replace her, we have King Charles the third. And for the first time for many of us, uh, virtually all of us, there's a King of England. Okay. And we know that our King Christ is going to make his appearance shortly. How, how shortly? Don't know. Feels like it's pretty short. But there's king imagery there. So an old world passing away, you know, uh, uh, this legacy uh, ending. And the very next day, President Nelson turns 98 years old. He becomes the oldest prophet or apostle of this dispensation, literally the day afterwards. So an earthly queen uh, passes away at a, at a younger age. I think she was 96. I can't remember at this point. President Nelson still going, a prophet of God, at a time when there's a there is a chance that he will live to see the second coming and not die, be translated or be um, you know twinkled from being being translated and then changing uh, directly over to resurrection. Um, we'll we'll have to see if that's what happens. So <clears throat> when we have her pass away, and then we have this other guy also in his 90s pass away this very powerful influential person uh that had relations had had a relationship uh, of of sorts at least they were acquaintances at the very least with queen elizabeth ii it's interesting as as things are changing right now um i forgot to mention you know th there's these so there's all these signs going on in the heavens right now uh there was that one on the sun on the 5th of september Going back one month on the 13th of uh, August, that's when there was that meteor over northern Utah, large bang, um, all, all the way from southern Idaho down to Provo. People heard it. And uh, the date is a mere date to when Angel Moroni dropped his trumpet. Angel Moroni dropped his trumpet 3-18-2020, and this happened on 8-13-2022. So 318-813, a mere date of sorts. Um, one, the first one is going quiet. The, the trumpet is falling out of his hand. He's no longer bl blowing the trumpet. Two days later, the, mission, the first presidency issues uh, the letter to bring missionaries back home. And then this year, after the April General Conference, a couple months after, you have this happen, a really loud event over the same area. Okay, the Salt Lake metro area and beyond. Very loud. All right. And uh, this is after they just asked for all these different, for, for like doing all these different talks, asking for people to go on missions. Okay. And this started a, a seven, I can't remember what it's called, a seven something countdown to Rosh Hashanah, um, Haftarah. It's the first of seven Haftaras of consolation leading up to the holiday of Rosh Hashanah. So this like seven Haftara countdown to Rosh Hashanah began the day that there was a bit, there was an explosion over Utah. Um, the day after President Nelson turns 98, we have the largest earthquake of the year on the 10th. And then we have an, a twin earthquake, the same magnitude uh, on the 19th. I think it was, wait, was it the, yeah, I think it was the 19th, one week before Rosh Hashanah. Um, Rosh Hashanah comes in the, on the Hebrew calendar. This is the changing of the year. So we entered the year 5783 and uh, it ended the sabbatical year. Every seven years is a sabbatical year. Um, it's called the Shemitah. So we went from the seventh the seventh year of the, you know, the week of years, seven years, a week of years, the seventh year is the Shemitah. And now we've started a new cycle. We've gone from seven to the new cycle. And we, we talked about that in the last video, you know, seven represents completion, perfection, eight, or the next day would be like a new beginning. And I feel like there's kind of a theme going on with that. Again, watch the last video or just watch my channel um comes up from time to time so we end this uh year of peace this year of um you know uh, the sabbatical year 
And now we're basically on Monday or the first day of the week. And uh, at the same time, oh yeah, by the way, at the very same time that Rosh Hashanah is happening, Jupiter, starting on the evening of the 25th, uh, which, which is when Rosh Hashanah starts, it starts at sundown, um, Jupiter comes the closest to Earth that it's been in 59 years. Okay. Now, this week right here, um, is this is what started the referendum vote. Um, depending on how you feel about it, it there was a, a supposed vote to break away from Ukraine, these four regions of Ukraine. Uh, it started on Rosh Hashanah, ended on Friday. The next day was General Conference, and the day after that, General Conference, a very significant general conference where instead of being the general conference of 17s, it becomes the general conference of 18. So again, from seven to eight, uh, even though it's, you know, 17 to 18, it's kind of still the same thing. And uh, this is the one where President Nelson calls on us to be the, um, the people of the second coming. Okay. Right as Russia is in the middle of going from this vote and then they finalize it on Yom Kippur, the holiest day on the Hebrew calendar. That that's the day that they they on as far as they're concerned, th going through their legal process, they that's the day that the annexation was complete. So, general conference was taking place right in the middle of that process, and it was in general conference was taking place during the ten days of awe. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur; these are the the high holy days. On uh, Rosh Hashanah, your name is written in either the Book of Life or Death. Um, or if you're a middle person, you have 10 days starting with Rosh Hashanah to get your name in the Book of Life. And on Yom Kippur, it's sealed. Okay, so these are the two holiest days. Uh, they're the two holiest holidays of, on the Hebrew calendar. And General Conference was taking place right in the middle of that as this stuff was going on with Russia. Okay, um, a week later, I think it was a week later after a general conference, right after President Nelson, the week before, said that we're going to see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen, uh, in a way, and I'm not saying that this fulfills what he, he was saying, but I think it could be part of it, we literally saw the largest explosion ever. It was in space, it was a gamma ray burst associated with what I believe is a supernova, it was kind of hard to follow, but it was a gamma ray burst, largest explosion ever recorded, exactly one, and of course it happened billions of years ago, but we detected it exactly one week after uh, President Nelson said that. Okay, it, however you want to view it, I think it's another sign in the heavens. It may not wow everybody, and we have to like rely on those who have the instruments and telescopes to be able to detect it. But it did, in fact, happen. And it happened a week later. So make of that what you will. Um, oh, my gosh. What else? What other things? Have, I, there's been, like, more stuff. But anyway, we have this election that's taking place today as I'm speaking, which is the 8th. Uh, which is interesting, again, because going from 7 to 8, 8 is the new beginning. Today is um, what a lot of people are calling the most important election day uh, of our lifetimes uh, because of what, what's at stake. And uh, I didn't mean, I think a lot of you thought that I was like um, <laughs> trying to favor one political group over the other, and I definitely was not. I think you misunderstood what I was trying to communicate. Um it's kind of it is kind of complicated though. Um, I think there's corruption everywhere, um, all sides. There's the surface level things, and there's the deeper things that have to do with secret combinations and Gadiat and robbers. Um, I think the world is very complex. Okay, uh, if you're just dying and you have to know, um, I'm I'm I like to try and stay more toward the middle, but historically, you know, I'm more to the right. Okay. And uh, that's that's typically how I vote. Um, so don't think I don't understand. I'm saying that like a, a red wave would be bad. I don't. But 
I think there's a lot of things that I can't like go into it in depth here, but I think there is reason to believe that this is a very important election. Um, <laughs> we'll, ju we'll just have to see how things play out. But what I can tell you is that, as a fact, uh, today is the first time ever that there is a blood moon that coincides with the day of the elections. I'm sorry, but you, you have to take that as a sign. You have to take that as a sign, especially if, you, if you're in the camp where you think the second coming is going to happen sooner. <clears throat> and, you, and you think that because what Sister Nelson said to the Canadian saints in Alberta and British Columbia just a couple weeks ago, she put up on the screen uh, what her friends said, quote unquote, President Nelson, this general conference was the best. We feel like you asked us to get on the ark. She was dropping a hint, uh, a not so subtle hint to all of us. Um, I know that there's some that are going to say there's too many things that have to happen and that's fine. I think that things can happen quicker uh, than we expect or in a way that we don't expect. And we may not have a full understanding of some of the prophecy, some of the prophecies, uh, which I know can be very upsetting because we want to know, we want to know exactly how things are going to happen. But um, I, I do think it's possible. I think it's possible, especially, especially this last conference when he's talking about um, the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power, us having privileges and miracles and blessings uh, between now and when that happens, when he comes, he shows us a, a, a video of Christ descending out of the air to the peoples of the Book of Mormon, right? And that was right after uh, the talk. So that was his last talk where he tells us, until we meet again uh, with tears. Um, I think it's very close to over. And my point in saying that is that for all anybody knows, maybe this is the last elections before Christ becomes king. I'm not going to say that or push that, but I'm also not going to limit it. Um, it very well could be that within the next four years, this is the last elections. Or, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, most of you, according to what you've said during live streams and polls and stuff, is that you think that it's going to happen probably within five years. Um, some go a little bit further and say 10. But this really could be the last elections in the United States that we see. And we had a sign maybe going along with that today at the time I'm recording this. And then uh, the kicker is that we have this influential person that passed away yesterday, the day before the elections. Um, let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, Queen Elizabeth. Let's see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> At the invitation of President Bill Clinton, Mr. Rothschild and Lady de Rothschild, um, as she was known by virtue of her marriage to a knight, spent part of her honeymoon at the White House. Uh, no, no, I'm not okay with that. That's not for you. Uh, but okay, yeah, just let, let people stay at the White House for their honeymoons. On uh, the Rothschild Foundation, da da da, uh, it just talks about here the Rothschilds are a pan European Jewish family who take their name from the house of their 16th century, okay, there it is, 16th century ancestors. Uh, da, 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 da. So if you want to know more, you know, there, there's a lot, there's a lot of opinions on this family. And I, for me, it's, it's, it's really hard to tell sometimes um, who's good, who's bad, because sometimes I'm not sure you can easily just call groups, uh, whether it's a family like this or whether it's a government or whether it's whatever, all bad or all good. Uh, I think it's mainly a game. And sometimes you have good people uh, that fight for good things. Uh, there wasn't anything here. There wasn't anything here. I was thinking that there might be, but no. And here's his Wikipedia page. Okay, so let's talk about 200. 
<clears throat> okay. So let, let's let's talk about this in context. Let's talk about this in the context of today, election days, the election day, and um, this guy whose family has ha had so much influence over the last 200 years, he passes away a day before the blood moon elections. Okay, so let's look at this from that point of view. I'm going to go back to an email. Uh, this is by, oh my gosh, I already forgot. Amy, I'll have to go to the end. Amy Baldwin. She sent me this a while ago. I did an entire video about it. But like I said, we're, we're coming back to it because it has a very interesting concept in it. Okay. These are like just some of her notes. Okay. November 2020. Excerpt from Don Bradley, The Lost, 116 pages. Um, there's a link for it. I'll, I'll put a link for the book in the description below in case you want to purchase it. Okay, here's what she shared. Okay, and you guys, it took me a while, kind of like, I thought this was gonna be, it was going to be easier, but it took me a while to like um, do this next part after we read this. Okay. A close reading of the small plates account of the first Nephite nation in the land of Nephi reveals the arc of this nation's rise and fall. Two centuries of rise, followed by two centuries of fall. Okay, so I have a visual aid to help us. This is on the church website. It's a timeline. You'll recall that in the Book of Mormon, you had the Nephites when they lived here in the land of Nephi. Okay, so here you have 600 BC. Uh, Lehi and his family leave. Uh, they come to the Americas, and for a long time, for a very long time, for 400 years, they're living here. Even though, you know, when you're when you're reading through the Book of Mormon, these books right here, Omni, Jerem, Enos, uh, they're very short, right? The majority of the Book of Mormon. The pages of the Book of Mormon are talking about this portion right here, this 100, or sorry, this 200 years, from about 200 BC to um, to when Christ comes. So here they are here, and they have roughly about they have uh, starting from 600 BC when Lehi was still in uh, in you know. Jerusalem in that area, but from you know roughly 600 BC to 400 AD, that's the 200 years of rise, and then after that point, it starts to decline. Um, let me continue. <clears throat> okay, so um, okay, in this arc, the one that we just talked about. The fur living in the land of Nephi. In this arc, the early Nephite nation paralleled the rise and fall of the later Nephite nation, chronicled in Mormon's abridgment in 4th Nephi, where the Nephites' pattern of progress culminates in the 200th year after the birth of Jesus and begins to lapse in the 201st year. So now, He's saying that there's a, there's a parallel between the green over here when they're in the land of Nephi <clears throat> and um, here after Christ's visitation. That you have and and it's colored that way. The yellow is like the time of righteousness, and then after two hundred uh, roughly two hundred AD, uh, that's when wickedness and division begin. So between these two periods. The early period and then the later period, they both spanned about 400 years, and it was at the middle that they reached uh, peak like righteousness and, and also uh, wealth and prosperity and things like that. Okay? All right, so back to this, and we're going to look at some of the details of this, uh, which I think you'll find interesting. The small plates account of this okay, the small plates account of this period identifies the other Nephite year 200, uh, 200 years from Lehi's exodus out of Jerusalem 
as the zenith of that nation's spiritual progress and material prosperity. Uh, that the two chronologies are purposely presented with a parallel in mind is further suggested by the appearance of yet another common date in the two chronologies. So if you have any doubt about these years, you know, 400 years with the midpoint being the the peak, the, the peak of the civilization, there's this other year both times, the year 320. So what he's talking about is, um, you'll remember that at this point right here, they were reckoning their time from the time that Lehi had left Jerusalem. So, you know, it's been 100 years since Lehi left Jerusalem, 200 years. So in the 320th year, there was something interesting that happened. And then you'll remember that when Christ came, they started reckoning their time uh, from the time that uh, he was born, that they knew that he was born. No, they started to do it. Oh, I can't remember. I think I think they started to do it like that once they saw the sign. Yeah, I think that's I think that's how it went. They started reckoning reckoning their time by uh, this sign. Okay, so 320 years from here, there's another thing that happens that parallels the very first uh, Nephite nation. The the way that he's saying in the email. Okay, so. <clears throat> And I'm going to show you what, what they are. Uh, in the summary record of the decline of the early Nephite nation, given in the small plates, the record keeper Amaron reports a watershed event in his nation's decline toward total destruction. It seems more than coincidence that in both chronologies, the year 200 is used to describe the nation's apex, that the nation is destroyed in approximately, if not exactly, the year 400, and that the year 320 is in each nation the precise year of a watershed moment in that terminal decline. Okay, so that's the end of the excerpt. Okay. And then Amy continues. Um, well, you know what? Actually, before we read what she's going to say, let's just take a quick look at what these books say. Okay, so the book of Jerem... Okay, now behold, 200 years had passed away, and the people of Nephi had waxed strong in the land. Okay, so we're talking about this first nation of Nephites. 200 years had passed away, so they were at about uh, 400 BC, and this was the climax of this nation. Okay, uh, so they, uh, the people of Nephi waxed strong in the land. They observed to keep the law of Moses and the Sabbath day holy unto the Lord, and they profaned not, neither did they blasphemy. And the laws of the land were exceedingly strict. Okay. And then it contrasts them to the, the Lamanites that were uh, completely different. Okay. Uh, verse 8. And we multiplied exceedingly and spread upon the face of the land and became exceedingly rich in gold and in silver and in precious things and in fine workmanship of wood, in buildings and in machinery, and also in iron and copper and brass and steel, making all manner of tools of every kind to till the ground and weapons of war, yea, the sharp pointed arrow, the quiver and the dart and the javelin in all preparations for war. And thus being prepared to meet the Lamanites, they did not prosper against us. But the word of the Lord was verified, which he spake unto our fathers, saying, that insomuch as ye will keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land. Okay, so this is their this is their peak. Okay. That's it for Jerem. Now we go on to Omni. Okay. And it came to pass that 276 years had passed away. Uh, which is kind of interesting because that, that 76 is a like a United States number, right? Because the, the United States was established in 1776, uh, became a country in that year. 
But anyway, that's not important to what we're talking right now, but it might be kind of like a signature or a hint uh, for us readers in modern days. Okay. Um, Behold, it came to pass that 320... Okay, so this is what he was talking about. It came to pass that 320 years had passed away, and the more wicked part of the Nephites were destroyed. For the Lord would not suffer after he had led them out of the land of Jerusalem and kept and preserved them from falling into the hands of their enemies. Yea, he would not suffer that the words should not be verified, which he spake unto our fathers, saying that insomuch as you will not keep my commandments, you shall not prosper in the land. Wherefore, the Lord did visit them in great judgment. Nevertheless, he did spare the righteous that they should not perish, but did deliver them out of the hands of their enemies. Just another time that this should be a lesson to us that, you know, the righteous will be preserved. Um, that's that's not to say that you're completely exempt from things that happen. You can get sick, you can get injuries, you could even die as the judgments of God come upon the earth. But um, as a whole, the righteous will be preserved as a people. Okay. And then down here, behold, I am Amalekai, the son of Abinadam. Behold, I will speak unto you somewhat concerning Mosiah, who was made king over the land of Zarahemla. For behold, he being warned of the Lord that he should flee out of the land of Nephi. Now, right here, you guys, I'm wondering if there might be a parallel between like Mosiah or King Benjamin one of the two, and President Nelson. Because as this 400-year period is coming to a close, there's this big transition. There's a big transition where they're living in the land of Nephi, and then they go to the land of Zarahemla. And uh, Zarahemla, you know, it's one of those cities that you could, like, compare it to Jerusalem. It's like the at the time the Jerusalem of the Nephites, right? The Americas. Um I think there I think there's similarities. And uh I and I know with like the people that are interested in like Book of Mormon geography, uh they be, they they believe I think last I checked it's been a long time, but I think they they believe that where New Jerusalem is going to be established is either at the site of Zarahemla or near it. Um, but that's not the point of this video. But you can take the spiritual lesson there that they were taken to like a a holy city, essentially. And, and there were times when it was wicked, just like Jerusalem. But you know what I mean. Okay, so... Okay, so think of like maybe Mosiah as President Nelson. Okay, uh, Mosiah, who was made king over the land of Zarahemla, for behold, he being warned of the Lord that he should flee out of the land of Nephi, and as many as would hearken unto the voice of the Lord should also depart out of the land with him into the wilderness. And it came to pass that he did according as the Lord had commanded him, and they departed out of the land into the wilderness, as many as would hearken unto the voice of the Lord. And we're kind of in this situation now. Are we going to follow the prophet? Are we going to stay with the church? Or are we going to apostatize? Are we going to go the way of the world? And they were led by many preachings and prophesyings. They were admonished continually by the word of God, and they were led by the power of his arm through the wilderness until they came down into the land, which is called the land of Zarahemla. And they discovered a people who were called the people of Zarahemla. Now, this is interesting because, well, let me keep reading. Now, there was a great rejoicing among the people of Zarahemla. And also, Zarahemla did rejoice exceedingly because the Lord had sent the people of Mosiah with the plates of brass, which contained the record of the Jews. Now, I guess I'll say it now. I wonder if this is a type of foreshadowing of when we will meet the city of Enoch. Now, in this case... When you're reading the Book of Mormon, if it is a foreshadowing, this is actually uh, switched around where uh, the people, the, the others, are actually at, in a worse condition 
than the main characters of this story, you know, Mosiah and his people. Whereas uh, when we meet the city of Enoch, we're going to be in a worse condition than they are. So that's one difference, but I think it, it could still be a foreshadowing. Um, Behold, it came to pass that Mosiah discovered that the people of Zarahemla came out from Jerusalem at the time that Zedekiah, king of Judah, was carried away captive into Babylon. And they journeyed in the wilderness and were brought to the, by the hand of the Lord across the great waters into the land where Mosiah discovered them. And they had dwelt there from that time forth. And it came to pass that the people of Zarahemla and of Mosiah did unite together. And Mosiah was appointed to be their king. That's interesting. That's interesting because at some point we're going to be united with uh, the city of Enoch. I guess if you want to look at this also, I, I mean, you could, um, as the Ten Lost Tribes, you know, being united again. Um, you know, I know there's a whole bunch of different theories out there, whether they are more advanced than we are or less advanced. So, but that's not my thing anyway. I'm not a main body person of the Ten Lost Tribes, but you could maybe look at it that way too. And they gave an account of one Coriantumr and the slain of his people. And Coriantumr was discovered by the people of Zarahemla, and he dwelt with them for the space of nine moons. It also spoke a few words concerning his fathers, and his first parents came from the tower at the time the Lord confounded the language of the people. So that's kind of interesting because even though the Mulekites were not descended from, um, they did not come from that time, uh, they came across somebody that was. And the Jaredites were not that far removed from, well, at least their origins. I'm talking about at the time of the Tower of Babel. Um, they're not very far removed from the next generations up uh, to Enoch. You know what I mean? So I don't know. It's kind of like a, it's kind of a stretch. But behold, I am Malachi was born in the days of Mosiah and have lived to see his death. And Benjamin, his son, reigneth in his stead. And behold, I have seen in the days of King Benjamin a serious war and much bloodshed between the Nephites and the Lamanites. Now, I don't know. Maybe this is, this could represent our next prophet um, or it, this could represent um President Nelson, or uh, possibly in a way, this could, maybe this could represent Christ, you know, coming to a new land, and there's going to be this new king, and his name is King is King Benjamin. Benjamin means son of the right hand, so that that's like one of the ways that Christ is described that he's the son of the right hand of the Father, right? He's on the right hand of the Father. Um. But anyway, a serious war and much bloodshed between the Nephites and the Lamanites. But behold, the Nephites did obtain much advantage over them, yea, insomuch that King Benjamin did drive them out of the land of Zarahemla. So a serious war, but their enemies were driven out of the holy city. Okay, you can think of that as New Jerusalem uh, or, or even just the stakes of Zion. Okay just in general. And then in the next book, interestingly, uh, verses 17 and 18, for behold, King Benjamin was a holy man and he did reign over his people in righteousness. And there were many holy men in the land and they did speak the word of God with power and with authority. And they did use much sharpness because of the stiff neckedness of the people. Wherefore, with the help of these, King Benjamin, by laboring with all the might of his body in the faculty of his whole soul, and also the prophets did once more establish peace in the land. That kind of sounds millennial. If you think of King Benjamin being kind of like a Christ figure, there's him and then there's the prophets. You know what I mean? And uh, because, you know, even though this is not talking about David and his royal lineage, this is talking about a royal lineage um, among among these, the the tribe of Manasseh, you know, the people that came, um, that descended from Lehi, the the Nephite royal lineage, I guess you could say. So there's kind of an, a possible parallel there 
where over here in the Book of Mormon, you have this royal lineage and King Benjamin is the one that brings peace. And King Benjamin was brought up a lot of times this last conference. Uh, in fact, this, this year uh, total. Um, on the phrase tracker, I uh, might as well just bring it up. Uh, here it is, phrase tracker. This is where I tally up how many talks use these words or phrases for any given year. Benjamin, King Benjamin has been brought up in 14 different talks this year. The, o the only other time that he's been mentioned more was in 1990 under uh, President Benson. But this year, just a spike in King Benjamin talk. I think that we should pay attention to that. And I don't know if it's because he kind of represents this. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe you have a different interpretation. Anyway, so <clears throat> looking at this, you have, again, you have the 200 years of uh, uh, increasing in righteousness and prosperity, okay, reaching an apex um, at the 200-year mark, and then declining. And in this case, in this story, I don't know if this could be a parallel for, this would be a parallel for the United States, okay, specifically the United States. Um, I'm going to read more from the email, but if this is the United States, you know, 200 years, uh, and this is going from the year 1620. I'll show you why in just a minute. So not 1776, but 1620. I'll, don't worry, I'll show you. Okay, so if this represents the nation, the, the you know, American nation, the United States, then um, this is like where things kind of change. Now you say that's that might be off because really uh, it's right here when Christ is born, that that would be the thing, or maybe when he comes to the uh, the Nephites and Lamanites, that this would be the better foreshadowing of the second coming. Um, I'm not sure that it's one or the other. It could be both. It could be like this is a foreshadowing, and this is also a foreshadowing, and this over here is also a foreshadowing, like three different foreshadowings, okay? Um, I don't know. These are just thoughts. Okay. And then, in the book of Mosiah, uh, this is still talking about King Benjamin, and now there was no more contention in all the land of Zarahemla among all the people who belonged to King Benjamin, so that King Benjamin had continual peace all the remainder of his days. So it's, it's a very, like, millennial time, kind of. Uh, you know, people are righteous, they're listening to King Benjamin. King Benjamin has them come to the temple, there's a, kind of like a, a Feast of Tabernacles thing going on. In fact, it probably was the Feast of Tabernacles. And we also did a video where it's there seems to be reason to believe that it was a Jubilee year. Um, and the year before that would have been a Shemitah. Um, you'll just have to go find that video. Anyway, that's it for, for this. Okay, now skipping forward to here to this last Nephite nation, uh, once Christ comes, there's some interesting things here. Okay, actually, before we do that, let's let's read more from the email. Okay, so Amy says, while reading the chapter explaining the Nephite years of ascension and decline in the watershed year, which is the year 320, I was reminded that the Book of Mormon was written for our day. So what does this information mean for us today? I started thinking about when our nation began. Did it begin with the Revolutionary War and the ensuing Constitution, or did it begin earlier, perhaps with the arrival of the Pilgrims? 400 years is a long time, so how could something like above play out for the United States of America, a land chosen for the restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ? According to Plymouth.org, the Mayflower arrived uh, in New England on November 11th, 1620. And by the way, we're coming up on uh, November 11th in just a couple days. And uh, yes, it was, uh, according to this, oh, this is the same source. Yeah, November 11th, 1620, um, right here it says they set sail on the 16th of September. So it, yeah, 
Here's another one, National Geographic, November 11, 1620. Okay, so um, if that were the beginning of this nation, and we add 200 years to reach the quote-unquote zenith of our nation's spiritual progress and, and material prosperity, uh, that would place the year in 1820, the year of the first vision, which began the restoration of the gospel in this last dispensation. To determine what the year was for, uh, quote-unquote, a watershed event in our nation's decline toward total destruction, we would add 320 years to 1620, and that is 1940. That could be a watershed moment uh, at that time. According to History.com, World War II officially started on September 1st, 1939. Pearl Harbor was attacked on uh, December 7th, 1941, according to National uh, World War II Museum.org. Whether the watershed was the beginning of World War II or the attack on Pearl Harbor, both sides are very close to 1940. Uh, later, I had an epiphany. Uh, was the watershed year 1941 in the attack on Pearl Harbor because our nation was attacked by another nation, giving the, uh, thereby having no protection from God. To determine the year the nation's progress will begin to lapse, we would add 400 years to 16, 1620. That puts us at the year 2020. Hmm. Uh, was there anything different about the year 2020? I can't quite put my finger on it. Obvious sarcasm in parentheses. So I put this on <laughs> I put this on a spreadsheet like I always do. The column on the left is um, okay, so this is mapping that out if, if that is how things work. okay? So this column, column B, let me zoom in. There's two ways that you can look at this, okay? You can look at it the way that Amy said, where basically, basically you just add uh, to the year that the landing happened of the Mayflower. So you would take the year uh, 1620, add 200 years, add 400 years, add 320 years, and that would bring you to that year. Uh, one thing, one other consideration or, or one thing to think about, it's, it probably ultimately doesn't really matter. But um, when you look at the way that the Book of Mormon talks, so looking at 4th Nephi, it says, And it came to pass that the 30th and 4th year passed away, and also the 30th and 5th year. So they speak in terms of years passing away. So if you, so for example, the, the Mayflower lands, okay? in uh, November 1620. The next month in December, you would not write one year has passed away uh, since this event, right? You wouldn't write that down in a record until exactly one year later. Uh, you would wait until November 11th of 1621, and then you would say one year has passed away since the landing at Plymouth. So you can look at it these two ways, okay? So first I have this green where it's the first 200 years, the lead up um, to the apex, okay? So here's 1721. So you can either say 1720, you know, you add a, 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 hundred, a hundred years, or in the year 1721 after, well, on or after November 11th, then you would say, a hundred years had passed away. So whichever way you want to look at it. You move on, getting closer to its spiritual apex. Um, this is the United States, by the way. So 1820 is what you get when you add uh, 200 to 1620. Or you could say, as of November 11th, 2021, at that point, 200 years had passed away since the landing at Plymouth Rock which would still be significant. I don't think it, it so much really matters. Um, I think it's the proximity that matters. Maybe some t maybe sometimes it's the exactness. I don't know. Uh, sometimes I feel like it's just the proximity. Like in the last video, we were talking about how in 1831, 
there was an eclipse that Wilford Woodruff felt was significant, but it was in 1831. The big thing that happened was the year before, in 1830, when um, the church was established. Or I, I also suggested that maybe that eclipse occurred that year because this is the year that New Jerusalem was identified in Jackson County, Missouri. So I don't I don't know. Um, and I, I don't think that we really will know until a prophet talks about that or we get some some kind of clarification. But anyway, OK, so you keep going on. So now after this point, uh, now the nation is kind of it's in decline. Right. Uh, which is interesting because it's right here during the 1860s that you have the Civil War. Before this point, you know, I'm no historian, but at least as far as like wars are concerned, there weren't any really serious wars um, after the Revolutionary War. There was the, the War of 1812, which was kind of uh, the Revolutionary War Part Two. Uh, that, that's essentially what it was. That's when the, the White House was burned down. But um, but nothing really big nothing really, really existential until the Civil War, which is in this red zone right here, okay? And then you get to right here, um, 1920 or 1921, November 11th, 1921, 300 years had passed away by that point. And then you get into the dark red, okay? The last, or wait, yeah, the, uh, yeah, of course. The the last <laughs> the last uh 100 years of the 400 year cycle. Um and what happens is World War II uh started in 1939, okay? From what from what I I looked up here um oops, I have this Oh, did I close out of it? Well, the, the war itself, it started in 1939. But for the United States, for the United States, it started December 7th, 1941. Okay. That's interesting because when you look at this, as of, no, so November, November of 1941 is when you could, November 11th is when you could say, that 320 years had passed away since Plymouth Rock. Okay. Then about a little less than a month later, that's when the United States uh, gets involved or is brought into World War II with the attack on Pearl Harbor. So if, if you read it that way, it actually is kind of precise. Okay. 1941. Okay, so you have this happen, and uh, this was, yeah, this was actually kind of a really big deal. This was a really big deal. Um, if if we look at 4th Nephi, I want to show you what happened at the 320-year mark. Um, I have to find it first. Um and it came to pass that when 320 years had passed away, Amaron, being constrained by the Holy Ghost, did hide up the records which were sacred, yea, even all the sacred records which had been handed down from generation to generation, uh, which were sacred, even, uh, even until the 320th year from the coming of Christ. And he hid them up unto the Lord that they might come again unto the remnant of the house of Jacob. So it was, it was not good. Okay. They had to like put the scriptures into hiding for for safekeeping, and uh, before that, let's see, came to pass that after three hundred and five years had passed away, uh, and the people did still remain in wickedness. Um, before that, you, you start to see as you go backwards the decline, exceedingly wicked, one like into another. In fact, let me just do it in chronological order. This will just take a second. Okay, so it came to pass in the in the thirty and sixth year, the people were all converted unto the Lord um, upon all the face of the land, both Nephites and Lamanites. Okay, thirty sixth year that was just just immediately after Christ. So everyone everyone's good to go. It's like a millennial state. 
okay, everyone's good, everyone's good. Uh, there was a um, uh, hundred years goes by. There was no contention in, in the land because of the love of God, which had which did dwell in the hearts of the people. Hundred and ten years, uh, the first generation from Christ had passed away, and there was no contention in all the land. Everything's still good. A hundred and um, okay, two hundred years. Okay, two hundred years. The second generation had all passed away, save it were a few. And now it was the it was this two hundred in first year. Okay. And now in this two hundred and first year, there began to be among them those who were lifted up in pride, such as such as the wearing of costly apparel and all manner of fine pearls and of the fine things of the world. And from that time forth, they did have their goods and their substance no more common among them. So they started, they stopped living the law of consecration. And they began to divide, be divided into classes, and they began to build up churches unto themselves to get gain, and began to deny the true church of Christ. Okay, 210 years, all manner of wickedness. 230 years, therefore the true believers in Christ and the true worshipers of, of Christ among whom were the three disciples of Jesus who should tarry, were called the Nephites. And it came to pass, they who rejected the gospel were called Lamanites. So there's the, the big division. 244 years, uh, the more wicked part of the people did wax strong. 250 years, uh, 260 years, wicked part of the people began again to build up the secret oaths and combinations of Gadianton. Uh 300 years, exceedingly wicked, uh, one like unto another, uh, meaning the, the Nephites and the Lamanites. And then 305 years, the people did still remain in wickedness. And then the 320th year, that's when the, the, the records were hidden. Okay. So that's what happened at this part of the story. If you go back to that first Nephite nation living in, in the, the land of Nephi. This is what it says. If I can find it. I can't remember if it... Sorry. Let's see. Are you serious right now? 276, 200... Okay, here it is. Okay, now in, in that first Nephite nation, behold, it came to pass that 320 years had passed away, and the more wicked part of the Nephites were destroyed. Okay, that's what happened to them. 320 years, the more wicked part of the Nephites were destroyed. So you look at our 320 years, our 120, 320 year marker, it puts us in World War II. And you know an interesting fact about World War II? It is the deadliest war in history. Okay? Largest and deadliest war in history. There were 85, uh, approximately, and 85, 85 million deaths. Okay, compare that to the next largest one here, 25 million. It's substantially bigger. It's substantially bigger. Okay, this is this is world history. The biggest war happened during this time, the 320 year mark. That's why I feel like this probably, yeah, it probably has substance. It probably does. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Um, <clears throat> okay, okay. So now we move on toward the top. And here we are. As of 2021, as of November 11th, 2021, 400 years have passed away. Okay. So 2020, obviously a big year. Uh, if you look at it at, in the addition way of adding 100, 200, 400 years, 2020 was the year. And the phrase tracker uh, seems to prove that, that it was a very important year. Because you'll notice there's this red line that runs through 2020. Uh, 
with probably the majority of the phrases, you have a, a spike uh, in the year 2020 uh, out of all these different second coming terms. Okay. And by the way, the, uh, they updated this, the scripture citation index, the tool that I use to, to update this. So they finally have the October conference up. So I'll be working on that probably starting tomorrow. I'm going to get everything updated because as, as of right now, most of these, I only it's only updated up to um, April 2020 general conference. So <clears throat> we're, we're in some kind of new phase, I think, for sure, because of 2020. Now, look at this right here. Uh, in this case, Jerusalem, Samuel, the Lamanite tomb, Christ lives. He is risen, comes again. Your spiritual, uh, your foundation. 2021 is the big year for those ones. So but between the year 2020 and 2021, um, you pretty much hit up all these different phrases. And that's where you have a um, a spike. OK, so <clears throat> it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, <clears throat> now, I just I had 1776 here and you can see that um, it hasn't even gotten to the uh, let's see, one, two. This would be the 300. It hasn't even gotten to the 400, the 400th um, set or, you know, from 400 or from from 401 to. <laughs> for heaven's sake from <laughs> um uh, oh <laughs> i can do it <laughs> you know the last hundred years the the last hundred years pressure okay pressure um so i don't think that 1776 is a good starting time and i think that this could very well be the case I do. Um, so that's something to think about. And that's something that's really interesting, especially in light of w World War II and the timing of that. OK. And uh, with them talking about King Benjamin, and as we're thinking about this possible parallel here with the First Nation, it seems like we're at a transition point. It really, really does, especially everything that we've seen this year, both in general conference and in the heavens and in society and in geopolitics and war. It's been a big year. It's been a big year. I think we're right here. I think we're about to meet King Benjamin. OK. And then, um, you know, we all know what happened here with the Nephites, uh, you know, good and then halfway through and then just bad 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 into like just utter destruction and carnage um okay so i was going to read a couple other things i'll probably you know i'll save this for another video but um let's talk about cutting his work short i i, I used the scripture citation index to check general conference talks and I wanted to see what they were saying in the journal of discourses and the scriptural teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. There wasn't anything for the scriptural teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, but I do have some stuff from general conference and the journal of discourses. Okay. So this is in chronological order and there's something very interesting in one of these that I want to show you. Okay. This is president Daniel. I'll, I'll zoom in. Okay. This is president Daniel H. Wells. Delivered in the Tabernacle, 1857. He says, The Lord will cut his work short in righteousness. Romans 9.28 And <clears throat> will okay, and will permit us, if we are faithful, to progress so fast that we may make, make up in a few years what we have lost in a thousand. Referring to the great apostasy. We may gain in a few generations of righteousness what 20 of unrighteousness have robbed us of. It is a work of righteousness which the Lord will bless and prosper. So this time that we have is short. Relatively speaking, you know, 400 years is short, but even shorter than that is 200 years, right? 1820, because that, that's really the start of the church. 
At the halfway point of the 400 years, that's when the church starts, 1820. All right. Short. Okay, now this is John Taylor, um, 1884. Okay, he says, But Enoch was clothed upon with the power of God. He walked with God for 365 years. Okay, that's almost 400 that that's interesting and we are told he was not for god took him that is about all that is said about him in the bible but we have other information many others walked with god and there was a city that the people were gathered to a zion they walked with god and they were instructed of the lord but it took at any rate 365 years to accomplish this object that's really interesting talking about these 400 year periods this isn't 400 years but it's close uh, furthermore in the latter days there's to be uh, a zion built up but in these days we are told that the lord will cut his work short in righteousness enoch in his day uh, had his messengers go forth among the people and when they gathered it was induced it, it induced the rage of man and great armies assembled against the saints but enoch prophesied by the power of god and the earth shook and the mountains trembled and the enemies of the saints in fear fled afar off by and by when the time came for the accomplishment of the purposes of god and before the destruction of the wicked enoch was caught up to heaven and his zion with him and we are told in latter Rev latter revelation in relation to these matters that zion will be built up in our day uh, the great trouble will overtake the inhabitants of the earth and that when the time arrives uh, the zion that was caught up will descend and the zion that will be organized here will ascend both possessed of the same spirit their peoples having be been preserved by the power of god according to his purposes and his children to take part in the events of the latter days we are told that when the people of these two Zions meet, they will fall on each other's necks and embrace and kiss each other. Well, that's that's to be seen. I'm not planning on doing any of that, but I'll be appreciative of them nevertheless. Now, this right here, this is interesting. This is from um, Elder Erastus Snow, an apostle. This is 1884. This right here really caught my eye. The Latter-day Saints realize, as I do, that every year brings us nearer to the coming of the Lord, that every month and week and day that passes over our heads brings us nearer to the great and important events that must transpire, and uh, that it does not become us to give away to a feeling of apathy and indifference, and to say in our hearts, the Lord delayeth his coming. And there are so many people in the church that do that, you guys, right now. Uh, after all this time has gone by, uh, since 1884, we still have people that are acting like that. He continues, um, and that tomorrow will be as this day and much more abundant. Yeah, that, that is the prevailing thing I feel, uh, with people that, that want to push it off into the future is that they're, they're looking at tomorrow. They're looking at continuing their, their riches, their prosperity, their goals, whatever it is that they want to accomplish in life. They don't want the second coming to mess it up, uh, which it really wouldn't. The second coming is the best thing that could happen uh, to anybody if you're righteous. Okay, so in that tomorrow will be as this day and much more abundant and that the next generation will be like the present and as the world has continued to roll on as generations uh, generations have come and generations have gone so will it be with us and our children i say it does not become us to give away to these sentiments and feelings which are common with unbelievers uh, with the world or with the unenlightened who have not a knowledge of God, who have not been favored with the light of revelation, who have not discerned the signs of the times. For we are, we are not the children of darkness, but the children of light. Light has come unto us. We have been called out of darkness unto light. We have been translated from the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of God's dear Son. And therefore it may and ought to be said 
of us, as St. Paul said concerning the saints, quote, Ye brethren are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. End quote. It is written, and we expect it to be fulfilled upon the heads of the unbelie- unbelieving and the wicked, that the Lord will overtake them as a thief in the night. In such an hour, said the Savior, as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is faithful, or who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom the Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, he that make, don't worry you guys, the the thing I I want to show you is coming up a little bit later. Then he shall make him ruler, ruler over all his goods, but... And if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with with the the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Now, it is not impossible, nor yet improbable, that there will be some among the Latter-day Saints who are called of God and appointed to this work, and who are set over their fellow servants to give them meat in due season, who will be found negligent, who will have forgotten their high and holy calling, who will have laid off their armor of righteousness, who will have become slothful and weary in well-doing, and who will have taken to eating and drinking with the drunken and smiting their fellow servants. But as surely as any such are found among the servants of God, they will be overtaken when the day of the Lord cometh, and their portion will be appointed with hypocrites and unbelievers. That's really serious. And I I certainly hope that none of you fall into this category where you think that, you know, all these signs are just nothing and things are just going to continue and, you know, you guys, the, the signs are abundant. I've only been doing this channel for a little over a year. And it never stops. There are so, there's so much. I have an entire I have literally put out a video, at least one video a day for over a year. And all my video <laughs> and all my videos are about an hour long. Sometimes I do more. Okay. There, I promise you, I promise you, there are an an abundance of signs that are very clear that it's really close. Okay. Now, I don't blame you if you haven't been watching my channel for very long. You may not have seen some of these things, but go back, binge watch my channel. Go ahead, do it. Binge watch my channel Um, because I've covered a lot of pretty incredible things. And I try and tie it down the best I can to um, what the prophets, apostles say and reading the scriptures, reading church materials. Okay, continuing. The work before us is a great one and very much remaineth, remaineth to be accomplished according to the prophecies. Israel is to be gathered, Dr- Jerusalem rebuilt, which that's happened, uh, Zion established, the vineyard of the Lord pruned and the corrupted branches cut off and cast into the fire. While the good branches shall be grafted in and partake of the root and fatness of the tame olive tree. There is a great work to be accomplished in the earth. But the Lord has said by the mouth of his servants that he will cut his work short in righteousness, in building up his kingdom in the latter days. True, when the Lord speaketh, he does not reckon time as we do. Uh, The time was in the infancy of this church when our minds were so narrow compared to what they are now, that we looked for the speedy coming of the Lord and the the accomplishment of his great work before this time. But as our minds grew and our ideas enlarged, we began to perceive that we were not, we were only children, uh, our views and, okay, that we were only children in our views and feelings, our ideas and expectations. We had the views, ideas, and expectations of children. And we see how the Lord has enlarged Israel and expanded his work. And now we behold so much more to be accomplished than that has been accomplished. That we are apt in our minds to put off the day of the Lord a great way. Uh, The time, the time, 
was that okay the time was that we looked for one temple the early revelations given to the latter day saints predicted a temple in zion in zion in our minds at that time was a little place on the missouri river in jackson county western missouri a town of a few surrounding villages or a country pre-adventure it, it may be as large as a county <clears throat> When we first heard the fullness of the gospel preached by the first elders and read the revelations given through the prophet Joseph Smith, our ideas of Zion were very limited. But as our minds began to grow and expand, uh, why we began to look upon Zion as a great people and the stakes of Zion as numerous and the area of the country to be inhabited by the people of Zion as this great American continent or at least such portions of it as the Lord should consecrate for the gathering of his people, we ceased to set bounds. Look at this. We ceased to set bounds to Zion and her stakes. I think this is a very important concept because I feel like, um, yes, the center place is going to be built again. Um, I'm going to have to dig into it further to see if I can nail it down that it has to be that the center place has to be built before the second coming, because that's one thing that many people will say, well, we know that we're not even close because uh, the church hasn't gathered at Jackson County. Now, we know from many different sources that the entire church is not going to gather there. Um, we have Missouri myths ensign that talks about that. Okay. And then, um, I feel like we look at this map all the time. Independence, Missouri. Go here. Um, <clears throat> okay. Independence. We already have a temple we have a building that's waiting to become a temple. It's the Independence Visitor Center. Just, I have an entire playlist about the Independence Visitor Center. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, just in summary, this was designed, its proportions, its measurements were designed so it could be part of the 24 Temple Complex. Right now it's being used as a visitor center. It's destined to be, be part of that complex. And right next to it, we have a stake. This is the center stake. As far as I'm concerned, right now, um, if we were going to move things over to independence, this would be the center stake. This one right here, um, and unless I'm mistaken. Okay. And we've looked at, when you look at the LDS meeting house locator, and you look at this map, you look at the Kansas City area, independence is right here. There's there are a lot of members in that area. These are just buildings. This isn't. I mean, we don't know how many wards meet in each building. Uh, we did check it out for the Independence Building, though. There's um, one, two, three, four wards that meet there. One right there. One, two, three, four wards in that one. Let's see Blue Springs. There's two. One, two, three, four. There's four in this building. So you get the idea. There's a lot of members right there in the Kansas City area. And we have a temple in place that can become a temple at any time. And we have a stake. And I've done the significance of what a stake was back in the early days. That a stake was going to be a city. And a city is a stake. That's that's what how things were planned. So going back here. Okay. Let's continue. Okay. Uh, you can see when we look at this map and we zoom out and we're talking about the American continent, I, I, I'm going to venture a guess and say that Zion is pretty well established in the Americas. <laughs> just look, just look at all those red dots. It's like um, North and South America have uh, chicken pox. So there's a lot. All right. Um, so seeing the different stakes of Zion that were being organized, we perceived the idea possibly of as many temples. I want to make sure I didn't. Okay. 
We ceased to set bounds to Zion and her stakes. We began also to cease to think about a single temple in one certain place. Seeing the different stakes of Zion that were being organized, we perceived the idea, possibly, of as many temples. Having had one spot uh, pointed out in the revelations for the temple in Jackson County, and by the way, it's not just one temple, it's a 24 temple complex. That, that was just going to be the first building, uh, the first temple built of the 24. Our minds expanded so that in a short time we were building another temple in a stake of Zion in Kirtland, Ohio. A little farther, or sorry, a little while afterwards, we were laying the foundation of a temple in far west, Missouri, and driven before our enemies. <clears throat> From that place, we next laid the foundation and built up a temple unto the Lord in Nauvoo. When we located in the mountains and laid the foundation of a temple in Salt Lake City, who of us had an, had an idea that before it should be content completed, uh, we should or we would be administering a temple in St. George, and another in Logan, and another in Manti. And who conceives the idea today that by the time these are all completed, and that the saints have officiated in them, we will be scattered over the American continent, building temples in a hundred other places. Well, you guys, this last conference, October 2022, that completed 300 total temples in various stages between construction, planning, and already operating. Let's go to our temple map, Elias temple map. Go to this one. Okay. They're all over. They're all over the place. 300. 300. Um, especially in North and South America. Okay, so 300. We just hit 300 this last conference. Um, our minds are beginning to comprehend the object and purpose of the temples of our God. We realize that they are places where the Lord bestows the keys of life and salvation pertaining to the everlasting priesthood and opens the door of redemption and salvation unto our dead. We begin to comprehend a little of the vision shown to Ezekiel, as recorded in the 37th chapter of his book, Ezekiel, while under the influence of the Spirit of the Lord, was set down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. He explored the valley, saw that there were many bones, and lo, they were very dry. The Lord commanded him to prophesy con concerning them, and he prophesied, saying, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Now, these were not the prophets and saints and righteous dead who had been partakers of the blessing of the gospel and of the priesthood while in the flesh, but were those who had passed off uh, in a day of darkness and in their lost condition, said to one another and said in their hearts, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off from our parts. But lo, the plan of salvation for the dead is revealed. The scheme which the Father had provided for the redemption of those whose hope was lost and who were cut off is revealed unto their children, unto those who have been gathered from their long dispersion, who have received the keys of the holy priesthood, which bring life and salvation to the dead as well as the living. Having these keys committed unto us, we proceed to establish Zion, to build up her stakes, to build up her temples, to gather together those who purify themselves before the Lord and qualify and fit themselves to become saviors upon Mount Zion. By entering into holy places and officiating for themselves and their dead, thus laying the foundation for the redemption of the dead, in being baptized for them, in being ordained for them, in being blessed and endowed for them, in receiving the keys and the key words for them, that in the day when the elders who have passed behind the veil shall preach to them the gospel of glad tidings and great joy, 
lo and behold, they will receive it and we will be put in possession of those keys, endowments, and blessings, whereby they may be, may be freed from their prison houses and be raised from the dead and stand upon their feet in exceeding great army and be restored to the blessings which God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their seed after them. So, I think this is the proper perspective, okay? That they didn't have a very good idea at first how things were going to happen. And uh, again, the early church, they, they had what they needed, and there was a lot that, that was revealed. But um, things progress over time, and there's more and more understanding over time. But now, now, being on the other side of what he's talking about in 1884, and when you're when you're looking at these maps with dots all over the planet, I think the time is getting close. I think the time is getting close. When you have a building that's ready to become a temple and a stake right there at that very spot, and then you have a um, another temple in that same metro area that's currently servicing these people that live in uh, the metro area of New Jerusalem, I think we're pretty close. Just that alone. Um, let's see, there's a few more things. Let's see. It is fitting that we should labor with diligence and faithfulness and that our mights to bring to pass the purposes of God in so much as they are rolling upon us rapidly. And seeing that he has promised that he will cut his work short, in righteousness. Since the father came forth from the heavens with his son and spoke to the prophet Joseph, then a boy, only 14 years old, and told him that all the people of the earth had gone astray from his ordinances and had broken the everlasting covenant. I say, since that time, what wonderful progress has been made in developing the arts and sciences. Um, those were the days of the stagecoach instead of the railroad. Then postal uh, postal facilities were very slow. It required mouths for communication to go from this country to Europe and back again. Now it is done in an instant. <laughs> this is funny because he's talking in 1885. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Now it is done in an in an instant. <laughs> Steam and electricity enable people to transact business in one day or an hour, perhaps. That used to take months to accomplish. The Lord is in his way fulfilling his promise that he would hasten his work in its time. He has increased facilities during our day and generation for the accomplishment of work and bringing out about his purposes, which it would uh, take many times as long to accomplish under the old regime, the slow coach order of things. Uh, 38 years ago, when we came across the plains, it took it took us all summer to get from Missouri River to Salt Lake. We had to walk and toil by the road. Our teams gave out and died by the way. A company of us in the year 1848 were from the 18th of February until the 19th of October, coming from Liverpool to this territory. Now the Saints start from the old country and come here by steam in about three weeks, a journey that formerly took nine months to perform. This is one of the ways in which the Lord is shortening his work, cutting it short in righteousness. And furthermore, he has said he will hasten it in his time. Now, that's kind of an interesting perspective because I, I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't know what the world looks like from the point of view of someone from uh, 1885, but they were perceiving back then that things were starting to speed up. And little did they know uh, what was ahead. Okay, Hubie Brown, this is 1955. Okay, he says, um, Our Heavenly Father, in order, as, as he has said, to cut his work short in righteousness, has made available to us such improved facilities of travel and communication as would have been nothing short of miraculous in the days of Peter and Paul, or even our pioneer fathers. <laughs> who we were just uh, listening to just a second ago. Steamships and airplanes enable us to go farther in hours than they could have gone in months. Radio and television have amplified the voice and made it 
possible to take the gospel into the homes of the people of almost almost all nations. Okay, 1955. Uh, 1963, Elder Legrand Richards, Council of the Twelve Apostles. As we have listened to the announcements made by, <clears throat> by our worthy president in the various meetings of this conference, as to the extent to which the proceedings of the conference are being broadcast into the various missions and nations of the earth, we are impressed with the privilege we have of living in this day and age when the Lord is doing so much to cut his work short in righteousness. We are told in the newspaper the other night that there would be a possible potential listening audience of 90 million people to our conference. Some of us are old enough to have uh, participated from this pulpit uh, when we did not even have a public public address system, when some of the brethren were weak, with weak voices could hardly be heard under the gallery. Just think of the difference. <laughs> 1963. Um, there was somebody, I'm going to see if I can find it right now. There was somebody that said, let's see. Uh, I'm going to try and find it. Because we were talking about Sister Nelson's talk. Where she said there was, um, there were 200 people that were watching. And she said it after she was talking about the adversary trying to stop conference. And um, I didn't know what she meant if she was talking about actual people. Um, some of you thought that maybe she was talking about people on the other side of the veil. Um, let's, let's actually do a search for 200. That might help. Somebody left a comment that made a lot of sense. Uh, I want to find you so I can give you credit. Well, there was, there was a girl that said that basically it was kind of like an estimate, just like what, just like what we just read here, where um, they had an estimate that maybe 90 people, 90 million people, um, there's a potential that 90 billion people would be watching this conference. The person that left the comment, and I'm sorry if you're listening, I can't find you. Uh, basically said the same thing. So I th that probably is what Sister Nelson was talking about. Um, now, this is interesting right here, too. Um, apostate factions will not build the temple. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I, I guess there was like back in the time of Joseph Fielding Smith, because uh, this is Doctrines of Salvation, uh, Volume 2. I think there were people back then that were thinking, well, maybe they're going to build the temple and then later we'll, we'll get that temple. Like once they're, they're converted or something like that. And, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith says apostates, apostate factions will not build the temple. He says, when the Lord shall speak the way, when the Lord shall speak, the way shall be open for the accomplishment of his purposes and all opposition will melt like the hoar frost from the rising sun. For, for thus saith the Lord, I will cut my work short in righteousness, for the days come when I send forth judgment unto victory. Behold, I will hasten my work in its time. So, um, again, I, I don't know how things are going to pl play out, but we do have this. And this came after Joseph Fielding Smith. Okay. At the time of Joseph Fielding, let me see, Joseph Fielding Smith. Wait, am I right? It wasn't before the time or it was near. Okay, let's see. Who came after him? Predecessor was David O. McKay. Oh, no. So by his time, this was built. This was built. So I don't know. Maybe he didn't want to say or maybe... That's maybe that's not what he's referring to. Anyway, well, whatever the case, even if this becomes a temple to fulfill prophecy, like if there has to be a temple right here, um, maybe this could fulfill it if they renovate it. 
and Christ can appear here. Um, either way, I think the plans are still in place to where the original first temple site, uh, there would be a temple built there, and this entire area landscaped and renovated for the 24 temple complex. So, yeah, there's probably going to have to be some changes anyway. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, that, that's it. That's it for this one. Sorry. It's like my videos just keep getting longer and longer. Um, you'll have to let me know what you think. You know, this whole thing with Enix people being about 400 years, these um, these two different periods in Nephite uh, history being about 400 years each, this one on this side, this one on this side, um, and then the central story takes place between them, which is kind of interesting. And then, um, you know, the year 320, 320 years since, you know, X, since uh, Lehi left Jerusalem, since Christ was born, since the landing at Plymouth Rock. It seems to line up pretty well, especially with the World War II thing. But that's basically spot on. That's basically like just exact essentially. Um, so if that's right, let me just give you a reminder of, of where we're at. We are right here. X marks the spot. That's where we're at. That's us. Okay. And uh, thinking about the eclipse that co that's coming up in 2024 and how Wilf Wilford Woodruff saw the eclipse as being something that happens the year after a good event, like when the church was established, then there was an eclipse the next year. Maybe the maybe that's what that 24, 2024 eclipse actually is. Maybe 2023 is the year. But I'm not going to say that for sure. I'm going to have to wait and see. Just keep watching. Um, I'll try and cover it all the best that I can. All right, that's going to be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.